Well, welcome back, everybody. Here's the Be Unexpected podcast with Wyatt and Jake. Today, we have a very special guest, John O'Leary. John has a couple different things. He's got a book called On Fire and In Awe, and he goes around speaking to businesses, sports teams, schools about his life and how he has turned his story into better. So John was in a fire accident in his house when he was a little boy, and he's just completely transformed what has happened to him when he was little to who he is now today. Yeah, well, I'm excited to hear, like, his story, how he overcame adversity in his life, and uh, I don't want to give much away yet, but he got a cool story with the St. Louis Cardinals and uh, Jack Buck, and so I'm excited to ask him about that and just his love for Cardinal baseball. So, Yeah, I'm excited to just you know, dive into the details, what it was like having that happen, and then how he used that to go forward, even as a little boy, um, and where he's at today. And I just want to read something from his uh, page or John and Larry Inspires.com. It says this, being out of bed doesn't mean you're awake. We spend a lot of our lives going through the motions. We want to live our best lives, but we're so busy that we usually settle for good enough. We hope tomorrow will be different, but we aren't clear how to live differently. We make excuses for ourselves, and it leaves us feeling unclear, unguided, and unfulfilled. Imagine waking up feeling alive, not just awake. Think about what you could accomplish if you stepped into each day feeling fully engaged and moved through life with joy, passion, and inspiration, and picture the clarity of knowing your best days are yet to come. Pretty awesome. So with that being said, here's John. Well, hey, John, how are we doing today? Jake, I'm awesome, my friend. Good to see you. Awesome. So it's so awesome to have John O'Leary on the podcast today. Uh, In awe, um, on fire, goes around the country speaking, um, sharing his story. So John, you want to share a little bit about what happened to you, you moon or younger and kind of what led up to today? Yeah, well, what led up today is you guys had the, the courage to reach out and it was my honor to say yes. So I love the work that you're doing and I love the lives that you've lived and that you're living today and what you're encouraging others to do in their lives. So that, that's, that's awesome. As far as what led me through some of the challenges of my life, I, I, one of the places that I think we may want to start actually is not with the fire. But with the fact that I went 20 years without telling anybody about it. So I I was 28 years old. I had never told anybody what happened to me as a kid, because why would you talk about something bad and unexpected in your life? So I certainly never did. And then I I was working construction, guys. I got a phone call from a little Girl Scout. She was in third grade. And she said, Mr. O'Leary. And I said, oh, let, let me get you my dad's number. And she goes, no, 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 Mr. O'Leary. Your dad gave me your number. Mr. O'Leary, would you speak at my school? And I'm like, about what? You know, and she goes, oh, your story. I heard about what you went through. Would you share your story? Guys, it's like one of those moments in your life where depending on your answer, it's gonna change what happens next. So I, I, I said, yes, I don't know why. I think it's a God thing. I said, yes, I practiced the talk for 40 hours. I delivered a nine minute lecture in front of three little Girl Scouts without once looking up at those little monsters, was not paid, no no compensation, no Samoas, but that's my first deal, man. So uh, it led to a second and a third and a fifth and a 10th. And uh, over the last 15 years, 2000 events around the world in front of a couple million people because a little Girl Scout asked and I said, yes. So I, I think there's power in asking and there's power in living yes through your lives. As far as what, what was the story I shared with them, and I'll be very brief, but ask follow questions if you'd like. When I was nine years old, I was burned in a house fire on 100% of my body and expected to die. I spent almost six months in hospital, lost my fingers due to amputation, a couple dozen surgeries. And that's the story that I ran from for the majority of my life. Wow. For those girls, uh, do you still have in contact with those Girl Scouts? You, you know what? It's, it's, I've never been asked. I've yeah. seldom shared that story. No. And I, I think there will come a time where some like beautiful, like 35 year old girl will come over to me and say, uh, you know, John or Mr. O'Leary. And I'll be like, yes. 
She's like, well, you, do you remember me? I, no, <laughs> uh, I'm the one. So I, I, I don't know when that will happen and I can't wait for it because mm -hmm. I'm going to give her a big hug and thank her because had that not happened, I'd still be hiding the scars. I'd still not be sharing my story and I'd still be living um, a pretty ordinary life. And I'm not bragging on the life I'm living, but I think God calls us forward to live our best lives, not, not easy lives and not necessarily successful lives, but our best lives. Mm -hmm. So after the fire, like, what was your recovery like? Like, like mentally that had to affect you and obviously physically, but like, well, why did you yeah, I mean, you and I share some challenges physically. I mean, so it's a long recovery and I'll, I'll spare you some of the details, but it's daily bandage changes. Those took a couple hours each daily occupational therapy for about an hour PT for about an hour speech. We did a little bit of counseling work even back then around what do we want to do with these, th these thoughts once we return home back to our lives. Mm -hmm. All of that took a long time, but as far as just like living, man, I mean, I got burned in January at age nine and I went back to school, I think in March, um, the following year. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of recovery. And even when I went back to school, I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't open up my own book bag yet. I couldn't grab my own books out yet. Struggled eating a sandwich. And one of the cool things for the young folks listening is my, my great concern as a young person was how will my friends treat me? Yeah. Cause I'm different man. And my skin's red my fingers are missing and I'm in a wheelchair and I'm I still have wrappings on my head where they're taking skin as a donor site. So I, I was really worried about how my, my classmates would treat me. And what I discovered is they were wildly welcoming. They were so encouraging. They were so loving. They jumped in line to sit next to me and to push me around the halls. And I credit that not to my, uh, I don't know, not even so much to them, although they deserve quite a bit of, quite a bit of the credit. We had nursing staff apparently go in right before I went back to school. And the nurses explain what little John had been through and that when he comes back, you have an opportunity if you want to treat him like dirt and have that at 10 year olds, you know, it's a popular thing to do these days, or you can treat him like the royalty that he is and that you are. And here's what that might look like. And they give him all kinds of examples on how to love this kid. Well, and, and credit to the staff, but also credit to these little kids. Like they did it, man. So they mm -hmm. stepped up for me. They love me well. And I think that's one of the reasons I was able to, take big strides forward in life yeah and so there's pretty much two options these kids said they could choose to treat little johnny and to see the way he is and see the way that he looks or they could choose life and choose to love him and choose to help him and it's really cool to hear the the ones and the kids who got behind you but i'm sure there was moments where people said well why is your the skin this color why are those wrappings what is this yeah you know, so for me, as an as a man, as an old guy in front of you today, you know, barely hanging on, man, I'm in my, my mid 40s. I, I enjoy the questions now. So if I were to bump into you guys, you know, in the, the airport or grocery store, bar or coffee shop, and you said, dude, what happened? It would be an honor to share with you. I find that adults don't ask. Adults stare, judge, and then look away. Mm. Kids, kids stare. And then they stare, then they stare a little bit more, and then they walk over and ask. And I've always loved that. I, I think it's so cool that it's different. So then they eventually walk over to you and ask. And usually while they're halfway through the question, mom grabs them by the arm and pulls them aside and say, don't be rude. Don't be rude. Well, all they're doing is asking the question, mom, that you wish you had. So I, I love the courage of asking questions and I, I give them the honest answer. I'm, I'm proud to say that I got burned and I'm proud to talk about how God worked through it. And I'm excited to share the people that showed up. And it reminds people today who may have been burned or may have been in an accident or may have been with cerebral, born with cerebral palsy or may have lost a job or a marriage or a million things that their life doesn't necessarily have to end like this, that it can be a reset. It can be the turn of a page and the start of a new chapter. So for me, I view these scars as an excuse to talk about the power and the promise of life. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about your book, In Awe and On Fire. I've read them both and I love them both, but there was one thing I was just going through it and see where I marked and stuff. I love to keep numbers on the bookmarker. Um, it says here in the introduction of In Awe, you say, I don't know about you, but I think it's time we address how we are approaching life so we can get back to living it up excited and inspired for what is ahead 
as you go on, you explain stepping into experience with the eyes wide open, fully immersed in the moment, um, right. and not concerned about appearance to others. And so my question is to you is I'm sure as for me, and I know for Wyatt, waking up in the morning, it's not all, you're not super motivated. You're not super encouraged. How do you stir that spirit um, to go out and it's for others? You're so other centered. Right. <laughs> Such a good question. So I think it's hilarious right now, as, as your listeners and viewers are tuning in, they probably hear this high pitch, you know, dental drill in the background. Well, that's, I'm not in a dentist office. I'm actually in my <laughs> attic in the third floor here in St. Louis, Missouri, hiding as far as I can from my neighbor's leaf blowers. <laughs> so that, that's where, what they're hearing in the background right now. And I heard that right before we went live. And the question that I asked myself was, why me? Like, oh, this is going to ruin it for these two guys who I respect and their listeners and their viewers. And I think that's an important question to ask on the front side of not only an interview with leaf blowers, but also on the front side of a day. Most of us wake up and the, as the alarm clock sounds or as the kid cries or as the, the quietness of the house almost drives you off the edge. The question most of us ask in the morning is why me? And we do it with our arms crossed, looking down, kicking the dirt. What I try to do, Jake, is, is when those things happen in my life, ask the question why me from a perspective of profound gratitude. My God, why me? What, why this day? Why these challenges? Why the leaf blower? Why these two men interviewing me? Why the opportunity to elevate this story for a cause far bigger than myself? Why me? So I begin every day very intentionally in gratitude on my knees because I, I want to make sure I don't miss this moment. I don't miss this day. I don't miss this chance. So for me, that's really important. And then as far as operationalizing this, uh, I live mission every day. I know a lot of organizations hang mission statements on their walls. A lot of sports teams, I've seen a bunch of your coaches get interviewed. They probably have a mission statement up on the wall that their players don't know. I know mine. So th this is what gets me out of bed and keeps me out of bed late. So my mission statement, the reason I choose to thrive and do great things is because God demands it. My family deserves it. The world is starved for it. Let's roll. Mm -hmm. No excuses. So dude, like... Come on, man. Let's yeah. go. Leaf floors be darned, man. I don't really care right now about those guys. I choose to thrive because God, the author of life, demands it. My family, the ones I'm here to serve, need it. The world is starved for it. Read the headlines if you don't believe me. Let's roll. That's language from Real Heroes on September 11th. Let's roll, boys. Let's roll. And then finally, no excuses. Because I'm I'm the queen of making excuses. So I, I, I do my very best to not only hear those words, but to live them. That's awesome. I love that you have your why. And I know I love hearing Wyatt explain his why and his purpose. And it's just really cool to hear that come full circle. Yeah. And, you know, you probably thought of like that as a kid, like going through all your recovery, but you also got um, a really cool experience with the St. Louis Cardinals organization and Jack Buck, could you uh, share that story with us? Yeah, I mean, everybody get comfortable. This is like a two and a half hour story. So uh, pour yourself up some coffee or something a lot stiffer than that. You will you will need it. And I'll, I'll try to truncate this thing down. But Jack Buck, for the folks who may not know, is the father of Joe Buck. So we'll start there. Joe Buck calls the Super Bowl and World Series. And he's a big time announcer and a very good guy. Well, Joe's great. But his father was legendary. And I loved his dad. I never met him because he's a Hall of Fame announcer. He's a national broadcaster. But more than that, he's the voice of the St. Louis Cardinals. I, you know that That's my team growing up, the Cardinals. That's my sport. I've heard your interview guys talking about throwing baseballs. Like, that's all I love to do growing up is throwing baseballs. And then I got burned on a Saturday, January 17th. On January 18th, I'm in a hospital bed um, in St. Louis on my back with my arms and legs tied down. I can't move. My lungs are burned, so I, I can't breathe. They put a trach in, so now I can breathe, but I can't eat or drink or talk. And my eyes are swollen shut. So it's a pretty dire situation, along with being burned on 100% of my body. So I'm, I'm dying and I'm struggling and the, the light is fading. And into this darkness comes footsteps. And I don't know whose they are. I hear a chair get dragged across the floor. And then I hear this voice cut through the darkness and the voice says to me, 
kid, wake up. It's Jack Buck's voice. Wake up. You are going to live. You are going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark will make it all worthwhile. Kid, are you listening? I try to nod and then he goes, keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark will make it all worthwhile. And then he leaves. But then the cool thing is he is told after leaving that little John O'Leary is going to die. And rather than just saying, oh, that's too bad. At least I came by to visit him before that happened. He goes home that night and asks the question, what more can I do? Which was what he asked every night of his life. And if you're looking for one takeaway from this podcast, it might be that for you to ask the question, listeners and viewers, what more can I do to make tomorrow even better than today? So athletically, for my team, for my family, for this community, for a world longing for it, what more can I do? So the following day, I'm laying as a nine-year-old boy on a Monday morning, dying in a hospital bed when Jack Buck walks back in. A guy I had never met before the day before comes back into my room, back into this deathbed, sits down next to me and says, kid, wake up. I'm back. You're going to live. You're going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark. We'll make it all worthwhile. See you soon. I wrote a book. I heard Jake, I think, mention it on the front side. It's called On Fire. I called it On Fire, not because I got burned, <laughs> uh, but because how God used extraordinarily ordinary people, like my brother Jim, like my sisters, like my parents, like janitors and CEOs and custodial staff, and ordinary, just ordinary folks, including Jack Buck, for this mighty purpose. It's unbelievable. It's on fire. So Jack was part of that story. He came into my life, as Jake kind of whispered and why you, you echoed, over five and a half months in hospital. He then picks me up in a Lincoln Town car in August, takes me downtown. We have John O'Leary Day at the ballpark, lives into the promise. It was awesome, man, meeting all my heroes, Ozzy Smith and Jack Clark and Whitey Herzog and all the boys, man. One by one, Jack rolled me around the players only clubhouse. I'm friends today with the general manager for the Cardinals. Those, the GM does not go there. Not, not during the season. Like that's sacred turf. Mm -hmm. And Jack Buck rolls me right in and says, Hey guys, I want you to meet this little boy. Great night. Broadcast the ball game together. He learns I can't do anything with my hands. Mm -hmm. And the following day, he sends me a baseball signed by Ozzy Smith, who I met the day before. And it says, kid, if you want a second baseball, write a thank you letter to the man who sent the first. He knew I could not write, but, but he also knew the power of motivation and inspiration to stretch. So I wrote a note to Ozzy, mailed it off, and two days later, got a second ball with a second note that read, kid, if you want a third, and then kid, if you want a fourth, and then if you want a fifth and a sixth. And I know some of your listeners are falling asleep, so I'll get to it. 1987, Jack Buck, a very busy person, sent a little nobody named John O'Leary, 6D baseballs, not one six, 6D baseballs teaching a little nobody that there's no such thing, that every story matters, that every life matters, and that it is mandated upon all of us to act like it. Your life matters, Wyatt and Jake and John, and let's act like it then. So, man, I learned how to ride, and I eventually learned how to live through the love of Jack Buck. So taking awesome. you taking your kids to Cardinals games these days, I'm sure I'm sure it has a lot more meaning and there's a lot more behind than just another ball game. Yeah. To you. What's well, so surreal? I mean, he was my oldest child is named Jack. To put this all in perspective, <laughs> so, uh, it kind of had a pretty big hand in my life and in my recovery and my in my ability to turn away from feeling brokenness. Every time we walk in, though, we park in the same spot. And when you walk past this area, you walk by this big, huge, it's like a bust. It's his face and a microphone in front of him of Jack Buck. And it's so cool to point out to these kids as we walk past Lou Brock and Ina Slaughter and Red Chainings and all these big time Hall of Fame announcers or players. They were great on the field. Good for them. Jack Buck was the best behind the microphone. Good for him. But the reason why he is remembered 21 years now after the death of after his death in St. Louis is not because of the voice and the calls. It's what he did in the community. 
The voice gave them the microphone to step into hospital rooms and prisons and retirement centers and veterans homes. Like that's what gave them the excuse. But then the man took the excuse and did something with it. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> I love baseball, but I don't love it for the box score. I don't love it for the trophy. I, I love it for what it does, not only on the field, but off the field. And I think it's an underutilized opportunity to use sports for what it's ultimately meant to be used for. Nice. So when you're recovering from everything, did you ever get back involved in sports, like as team manager in high school or? Right. So, yeah, man, I mean, I managed my baseball team grow, uh, in grade school. I managed the basketball team <laughs> and I got a technical foul for yelling at a referee in one tournament. So I never yelled at a referee again in my <laughs> entire life. So this little seventh grader learned a very important lesson. Sometimes you got to learn to be a man, to be a lady, to be a person of respect in particular to our refs. So um, lesson learned referee. Thank you for teeing me up on the bench. I played soccer um, extracurricular wise. I love soccer still. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm missing my fingers. So it's hard for me to throw a baseball, but I can shoot a basketball. I play basketball almost every day. When I come home from work with my kids, I balance the ball on my knuckles and shoot underhand and I whip them almost every day. So like, listen, I, I think, and why you're living proof of this, man, like we, we set boundaries for ourselves, but then you, if we decide we can break right through them, we, we almost always set these ceilings that if you determine and you're passionate and you get some love from others and they guide you through it, we can bust right through ceiling after ceiling. And I just, I'm not that impressive of a human being, but I had awesome coaches and announcers and parents and guides and pastors and friends love me. So eventually I could learn to love myself. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. All the people pouring into you and now you're able to do things that you never imagined. That's pretty amazing. So John, what is it? Like today, so obviously I said before, you're doing a lot of speaking engagements. You have a podcast, book. What is what is life like today for John O'Leary? Uh, awesome. That's an arrogant answer kind of, but I just feel <laughs> so blessed, man. So my work involves speaking and I get to travel around the country and around the world. Like that's an honor. As much as I enjoy the, the audience, like one to many Afterwards, I get to go to the back of the room. They come up with books. And one by one, I get to sign them, which is lovely. But the real thing there is I get to hear their stories. I know you guys are all about stories. Like I, I love stories. Yeah. So I, I, I celebrate that work of hearing their stories and making sure they recognize that those stories matter and that their best days are in front of them. So I love that work. I do a podcast. It's called the Live Inspired Podcast. We've done 506 episodes most recent was with a guy named Dog the Bounty Hunter. Like, I mean, in what world does a broken Midwest kid who doesn't believe in himself have the chance of partying with Dog and Bob Costas and Cal Ripken Jr. and Ozzy? Like, it's unbelievable, man. So only God can do things like that. So I'm, I'm grateful to do a podcast that goes around the world. We have a coaching organization. So I get to go back in and coach and consult with organizations and uh, help their people become the best versions of themselves, work together on projects. And more than all that, I'm a son to Susan and Denny. I got to sleep on Denny's couch last night because he, uh, he's got Parkinson's disease and my mom is out of town. So I got to take care of my dad. So if you're hearing a little <clears throat> crasp in my voice, it's because that's work, man. <laughs> but I love it because I realize what my mom does every day. So I got to party with my dad last night, get home early, take my kids to school. I got four kids, one wife, one dog, one awesome life, one God. And I'm just grateful. <laughs> Honestly, you asked, what is my day like in the morning? When I have the chance to wake up, I'm grateful because eventually mm -hmm. I look in the mirror and I realize, like you, Jake, I should not be here. Mm -hmm. What did I do differently than the others? Why 100% burn? A car accident that killed everybody else? Why are we here? Mm -hmm. And you can spend the entire life if we choose as a victim to that thing, whatever that thing is, or you can choose to recognize for something. And my job now is to daily wake up, give gratitude for life and then figure out the next right step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's so cool. There's, yeah, there's many times when I wake up and it's just, I don't feel it, but there's a reason there. God has a purpose behind it. If not here uh, in heaven, we're going to figure this out and I don't need to be so worried about that but yeah there is purpose in today and just to remind yourself of that it's not easy but it's so 
foundational and it just changes everything. Mm. So. so John, what is one book you would recommend to others other than your books and just one closing statement you want to leave us with? <laughs> So uh, obviously, I recommend everyone race to the library, grab on fire and in awe immediately, people. Yes. Yep. So uh, to be honest, the book that I, if you said, John, one book off the bookshelf, I'm a voracious reader. I read three books last week. So I, I love reading and I do a podcast and I like to read the books like you guys ahead of time. As far as the most moving book for me, I would probably actually, oddly enough, choose a book called The Return of the Prodigal Son by a man named Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen was a, a maybe a Jesuit, uh, maybe he taught at Notre Dame for a while. Eventually, though, this famous author moves to Canada and works with adults who have special needs. Mm -hmm. And that's when he recognizes the, the call on, his, on all of our lives to not try to strive for you, but to strive to serve others. And eventually that work leads him to Russia where he, where he sits in this museum and looks up and sees Rembrandt's painting, The Prodigal Son. It's I think six feet by four feet. It's this massive painting of a father coming out to a son and loving him. A broken kid on his knees begging for forgiveness from his dad and then a judgmental brother off to the side. And I promise you when you see that picture and you read that book, you will recognize we are both those kids. We're on our knees, messing up all the time, sandals broken, poor, shaved head, the life of a slave. And we sit there with our hands clasped, judging everybody else for not living up to our expectations of their life. And the call, as Henry put it forward, is, yeah, we are those. And we're called to be the dad. So that, that book just, when I grab it, it blows my mind because man, we're called to be this, this perfect embodiment of love. And by the way, for the ladies listening, the father in Rembrandt's painting has a powerful right hand, big, mm -hmm. big athletic man, probably a quarterback in high school. And then on the left hand, and this is a world-class artist, dainty and feminine and light and meek and genteel. And what Rembrandt's reminding us of, it's, it's not either or, it's yes and. We, we need the mom and the dad. We need toughness and we need kindness. We need compassion and we need certainty. We need these things playing together as one. And I, I love that painting. I love Henry Nouwen. Um, so the return of the prodigal son. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I've amazing. read his book uh, here and now. Yeah, it's another good one. Yeah. So it's just awesome, man. Yeah, it is awesome. So real quick, you're a Cardinals fan. What did you think about the Cardinals season this year? Albert Pools, you know, he went into the record books, but it was a rough ending of the season. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you asked why. Thank you for bringing us to this interview. I think the season was a roaring success. Yeah. And to define it as anything other than a first place team with some incredible veterans who showed us what love and excellence looks like at any age on the field together, filling up a stadium, bringing people back together, finishing in first place, having one player go over 500 home runs, or gosh, what, 700 home runs for a career. Yeah. If you can't get fired up by that, then you don't understand what sports is about. I, like I said on the front side, I don't really care that much about the final result. Mm -hmm. My friends in the front office will resent me for saying that, but I think that stuff is out of our control. What yeah. we can control is how we show up. What we can't control is the team we put on the field. What we can't control is the effort we exude. What we can't control is two bad games in early October and the Phillies take it. You just can't control that. It's, it's random chance. So the fans can get mad and say, we need to do a far better job organizing, organizing a team. I think we did an awesome job. And I think we had an awesome season. Very successful. Yeah, especially in baseball. That happens all the time in baseball. Like the best yes. team doesn't always i mean the phillies made the world series yes that's crazy not a knock against the phillies but <laughs> yeah not a knock but they were the sixth seed that's correct at least and it's like as long as you're on the field you got a shot that's so, right but and plus i don't think people realize how hard it is to hit a baseball it's pretty you can have one game where you're on fire in a bunch of home runs and the next game there's somebody throws a no hitter because you can't that's, hit that's right so, it happened two days ago right yeah phillies five nothing then they lose five nothing, and they get no hit. The same great team, the juggernaut, they can't be stopped, gets no hit. Yeah, so it's, it is random, and that's, I think it's kind of like life. That's why I like sports. Yeah, 
you just don't know. Yankees are watching from home. Dodgers are watching from home. Huh? That's life, man. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks so much, John. Any last closing words or anything you'd like to say to, to close us out? Yeah, just sometimes when you hear podcasts like this or like yours, guys, people might walk away thinking, gosh, those guys uh, seemingly have it figured out and they seemingly are happy every moment of every day. And what I want everybody to recognize is I'm not, I don't have it figured out. And I'm certainly not happy every moment of every day. My life and my father's life and my family's life and yours are filled with challenges and occasional despair. And after a long pause, we have an opportunity of looking east every morning and watching the sun cut through the darkness and being re reminded that, you know, evil doesn't win. Light pushes back the darkness. God is still God. Our life still a value and the best is yet to come. Mm -hmm. So I just want folks to know if like they're struggling right now, it meant me too. And it's okay to struggle for a while. It's okay to ask the question, why me? Why did I lose my friends? Why, why was I born with a diagnosis I didn't sign up for? My family didn't sign up for? Why was I burned? Why did I lose that marriage or that? Thing? It's okay. And it's okay to recognize at some point in the journey forward to arise, to look east and to, to step forward. So that, that my prayer for everybody is that, that you recognize that day will come for you too. And, and uh, I can't wait to high five you when it does. And I'll love you on the way there. Awesome. Well, thanks so much uh, for being with us, John. And go check out his book, In Awe and On Fire. Uh, thank you so much, John. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, yeah. Wyatt. Wow. Well, what an interview with John O'Leary. Just such a, uh, yes, a positive man, but just knowing his why and his purpose um, and turning his story for better and what he has done. But he know God has a purpose for him. And that's so awesome and how he shares there at the end how he could he could come off or i come off or white come off like we have this thing figured out or life's um we're super positive but no and i would why and i were just talking sometimes life just stinks sometimes um we're not we don't got to figure it out but he said what look to the look to the sunrise and just look that there is purpose there is hope and how he was so other centered um and getting to know people's stories when they come after he's done speaking they bring this book they sign it and like we have shared why it they get to know us their story and get to know what has moved them and what they're passionate about yeah what i thought was really cool was you know for 20 years he didn't talk about you know going like being in the fire and everything he went through and i think you and i can relate to that because like it is hard to talk about you know dramatic stuff like mm -hmm. that but then like those three Girl Scouts, they wanted to hear his story and then just took off from there. And he kind of realized like, oh, this is what you know God wants me to do. He wants me to share my story. And sometimes that's not always the easiest thing, but, you know, it can really help people. And, you know, just as I'll put on life and, you know, how he sees life as, you know, a great thing every day and accept challenges whenever he's faced with them and he overcomes them. And, and I also thought his story would you know, the St. Louis Cardinals and Jack Buck that really showed like, you know, you know, sports isn't the most important thing in the world, but it can help you uh, get through some pretty tough times in your life, whether it's a team or a uh, announcer like Jack Buck, like people that come and help you and tell you to fight that one person that can tell you like, just keep fighting can mean the world to you. It just keep going. So. Yeah. He shared, um, he will have showed us he doesn't have thumbs. Um, yeah. So, and he, and he said he doesn't sit on the side when his kids play basketball or soccer. What does he do? He gets in. So every day he still plays basketball with his kids. He runs around, he plays soccer. And so he didn't let that uh, dictate his life or, or what has happened. So it's just pretty cool to, just to see where he's at. And then just to get to know how his mindset was after the fire and coming back to school and how he was treated. Uh, I can only imagine having all those bandages being pushed in a wheelchair and that's what happened. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, well, thank you for listening to the Be Unexpected podcast. Uh, check us out on Facebook, um, Twitter, and Instagram. Email us at beunexpected100 at gmail.com. And also, White and I would love to come speak to you, uh, your kids' basketball team, or smaller group. So reach out to us on Facebook or Instagram, and we'd love to connect with you. Thanks and see ya. See ya.